In this video, I will be going over the social identity theory. Human beings are innately social animals. We have the need to belong, but at the same time, we have the need to distinguish ourselves from others. The, the social identity theory is based on the assumption that people make sense of their social world through classification of what is us and what is them, which, makes, um, which involves making a distinction between the group we belong to and those that we don't belong to. In order to give more context, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs suggests that once we have achieved uh, our basic cardinal needs of food, water, and shelter, we have the need to achieve a sense of belongingness and also self-esteem. The social identity theory considers for both the sense of belongingness and also self-esteem. The SIT suggests that we have multiple social selves and identities, that is based on our membership with a certain group. Since we have multiple social identities, the theory also suggests that in a given situation, the most salient social identity will influence our behavior, which basically means that the identity that becomes most apparent is taking the front stage, uh, like in this example or this picture, uh, is the one that is likely to have an influence our, on our behavior in that situation. In the article that you read, the author discusses salience through his identity as an American, which is his country of origin, and his identity as a professional working in the Czech Republic. The same example can be applied to me as well, who is a pro who, as a professional working abroad. During this crisis, people have been quick to play the blame game, to wipe their hands off and divert focus as well. In India, it has been a little bit of the same situation. While I luckily do not have any friends who engage in such kind of behavior, there are people who I've come across on social media who have gone ahead and joined the bandwagon to blame China for the virus. And my immediate responses have been of distress and also anger which is possibly due to my salient identity in that situation of being a foreigner in China and having experienced life and the people there firsthand. Following that feeling, I've either responded to their message and in most cases, the person has been able to understand the new point of view, but there are others um, who have been resistant to changing their view all in all. But in this case, my identity as a foreigner in China becomes more salient from my Indian identity, which apparently right now is associated a majority of the time with um, trying to save face of our own country. The social identity theory has high relevance to knowledge acquisition and even knowledge production and making links between your subjects that you learn um, as part of your uh, and your core, which is theory of knowledge, is a very important part of IB. So the social identity theory, like I said, has high relevance to knowledge acquisition and even knowledge production. An example of a knowledge question could be, to what extent is the acquisition of knowledge based on perception? While you're discussing perception here, one could argue that perception can be dependent on our salient identity and may even be biased in that we focus on information in the environment that confirms our beliefs relating to that salient identity and ignore, re uh, reject, or even defend against beliefs that don't match that of that salient group. In terms of knowledge production, the mere forwarding of WhatsApp messages that can propagate a specific uh, objective of a political party um, in a favorable manner is also related to the need to establish positive distinctiveness between an in-group and an out-group. So the main points that we've covered so far is that um, social identity theory we suggests that we have many social identities, and in a given situation, the most salient social identity will influence our behavior. Moving forward, a social identity is created based on three main mechanisms, social categorization, social comparison, and the tendency for us to use our group membership as a source of self-esteem. 
Social categorization is the process of classifying people into distinct groups based on shared characteristics or attributes. This could be as simple as the gender you associate with and as complex as having like-minded objectives with a political party that you identify with. And people can categorize and even develop a social identity based on minimal parameters and similarities. And once social categorization has been achieved, we can differentiate between our in-groups and out-groups, or in simple terms, the us and them, which again helps us understand the world, the social world around us. Then there's social comparison and self-esteem. Once we've found our in-groups and achieved our need to belong, we start acting upon our need to be distinct and unique. And this is where we start comparing our in-group with outgroups. And this is based on our tendency to use our group membership as a source of self-esteem. Self-esteem is our perception or belief about our own worth and our abilities. So if a group that we belong to is perceived in a positive manner, that boosts our self-esteem. And if it is um, perceived in a negative manner, that deteriorates or has a negative impact on our self-esteem. Self-esteem can change from situation to situation and from group to group as well. But the main effort is to maximize our own self-esteem through our groups. And one way this is done is by favoring our in-groups with positive attributes and um, increasing the difference with an out-group to achieve positive distinctiveness. And this is also often uh, achieved by uh, out-group discrimination, which is attributing negative um, characteristics to the out-groups. And this kind of comparison is usually not necessarily based on logic, but often based on biases such as confirmation bias. Okay, and again, with the, set, with the need to achieve higher self-esteem or a better improved self-esteem. Tajfel et al. in 1971 conducted an experiment on the minimal group paradigm. The participants were first asked to rate 12 paintings uh, by two abstract artists, Paul Klee and Wesley Kandinsky. As the name minimal group paradigm suggests, the participants who were 48 boys from the same school were then divided into two groups, either belonging to the Klee group or the Kandinsky group, and were told that the categorization um, was based on their artistic preference from the earlier ratings. Even though this categorization was mere random allocation to, the, to either groups. This set the minimal parameters to test for the intergroup behaviors that could be observed from this procedure. Participants were then asked to award points to two boys from either from, well, from one from one uh, in-group and one from the out-group. Um, the points were given based on three choices of rewards, uh, and this was based on the Klee and Klendinsky uh, procedure that Tachfel et al. put together. So the first option was maximum joint profit, which means giving the largest rewards to members of both groups. So both groups would have the same value um, allocated if this choice was um, selected. This would be the case if a CLE member chose a mid-range value for another CLE member. It would then give the Klendinsky uh, member the same points for the other group or for the out group. The second one was maximum in-group profit, which is giving the largest reward to a member of the in-group. And in this experiment, this would mean if a CLE member chose a high value for another CLE member, it would give a higher profit to the out group, which is the Klendinsky group or Kandinsky group. And finally, there was the maximum difference uh, option, which is giving the largest possible difference in reward between a member of the in group and our, uh, a member of the out group. In this case, it would be if a CLE member gave another CLE member a low value, that was the option, it would reward the Kandinsky member only one point. And even though here the lowest value would be achieved by the in-group as well, 
um, a lot of the idea is that there would be a lot more difference between the two groups because the out group would only achieve one point. The results showed that the boys allocated points to maximize profit for the in-group, which is referred to as in-group favoritism. So they tried increasing as many points as they could by giving maximum points or high points to the in-group. Um, and when given the option, they chose to maximize the difference, even though that meant lesser points for their in-group too, right? So the lowest allocation of points was the one that allowed for maximum differences, okay? Uh, so despite that, they chose that value the most or to give that value the most because that established positive distinctiveness between their in-group and the out-group. This is quite odd because let's say, for example, if the points meant that you um, got apples, right? Uh, it would make sense for you to have maximum joint profit because that would mean that both groups, let's say for every 10 points, got one apple, right? So both groups had enough apples for all members of both groups to survive on those apples. But what really happened was just to make sure that there was a positive distinctiveness, they were willing to take the least points that they could give to their in-group just so that there was a maximum uh, difference between the in-group and out-group and that there was positive distinction and distinctiveness and this could mean that the group might not even have two apples for them to serve 24 people right so that's just an example there's no apples involved that's just trying to make sense of what was happening um, but this experiment in a whole goes in to show and suggest that we need the minimal similarities to form an in-group and our membership with that group. And also, it shows that we can exhibit discrimination towards an out-group um, and try establishing positive distinctiveness even at the cost of our own group based, again, on minimal characteristics that tie that group together. Another example of how social identity influences behavior and attitudes is with regards to um, several countries' attitudes towards uh, and discrimination towards immigrants. Um, this is seen in many nations, especially those with high populations such as India and the United States. People are averse to the idea of immigrants settling into their country and gaining citizenship as it threatens their own identity. And in a country like India, where the population is so high, which is like 1.3 billion, uh, more than that actually, um, and the resources available are in ration, this may in fact threaten their ability of um, surviving as an individual. And this can go back to um, the theory of evolution, right, and natural selection, the survival of the fittest. Uh, in this case, the in-group and out-group dynam dynamics also influence survivability, and the discrimination can go to that level of um, will I survive if I am permi permitting you to use or be um, part of this society and use the same resources that is so scarce between the two groups already, okay? Um, and the groups, finally, this is in addition to what was um, part of the article. The groups that we belong to and our subsequent social identity are not static. They're not fixed. They are dynamic and they can change over time. Uh, and again, over situations as well. Um, it is possible to move in and out of groups based on how successful we feel that group is serving our self-esteem, right? And if we feel like there is a threat to this, uh, how the group is being perceived, if it's a negative perception of that group, which then goes on to obviously affect our self-esteem, we resort to three basic strategies to compensate for that threat or for that yeah, threat to our self-esteem, okay? The first one is social mobility, which is for a person to leave or disassociate himself or herself from the group. Um, in the experiment conducted by C. Aldini, um, you saw that when a team loses, right, the fans of that team chose not or were less likely to 
wear jerseys associated with that team. And this is an attempt to disassociate from that team because at that moment, after that game, they are being negatively perceived, right? And even if this is momentary disassociation, this is one example of social mobility. And in some cases, people might completely disassociate and leave a group because it is only causing uh, a negative impact on their self-esteem. The second strategy is social creativity, which is a person's attempt to seek positive distinctiveness for the in-group by redefining or altering the elements um, through which the comparison is happening, right? In Festinger's research, um, despite there having been no flood, right, um, the members of the Seekers cult maintained their membership and credibility of their group by trying to rationalize that their belief and their faith um, saved the world. So instead of focusing on the fact that the flood didn't happen and their beliefs are probably a complete hoax, um, they increase their self-esteem by taking credit for saving the world, which is self-serving and also improves self-esteem as related to their membership to that in-group. Okay? So instead of moving away from that group, they found different parameters or different elements to compare um, themselves from others. Okay? And as much as looking at it as they, they as an in-group save the world. Okay? And finally is social change which is challenging or looking for direct competition with the outgroup in an, in an attempt to basically redeem or retrieve the high status that was once there. And this is very common in sports and fights and maybe even debates where you're trying to redeem yourself. So you challenge a team or another person to a rematch, for example, right? So that is one example of social change. So all in all, the social identity theory is complex in its nature, and it does describe several social behaviors in a comprehensive manner. But this theory is weak when it comes to its predictive validity and power, um, because the only prediction it can really make is pretty broad. And that is that most the most salient um, social identity is the one that will influence behavior in a given situation. Okay. Apart from that, it can't really predict behavior. It can b explain behavior that has already occurred potentially, right? And also, that kind of explanation is pretty generic and does not have the predictive validity. And also, when you're looking at social identity theory in isolation without looking at individual differences and other factors in the environment, it can be quite reductionist, right? And it can also be pretty deterministic. So even going back to the example where I'm defending my host country's um, esteem or identity, um, it could be not necessarily associated with my social identity, rather my personal identity, okay? Which might be high on ensuring social justice, right, and equality, and not um, engaging in hearsay and just discriminative behavior. So even if I didn't have a social identity associated with another country, maybe somewhere, I don't know, in Europe, I have no association there, uh, I might still defend that country or that identity um, because I believe that there needs to be equality and people don't need to be blaming and just spreading rumors, right? So it might be based on my individual identity and individual differences rather than the group that I associate with. So apart from Tajwal's research, there are several other researchers that have investigated um, the social identity theory and tried explaining different behaviors, a few of which are the ones that I've mentioned on this slide. Um, the first one, Abraham et al. tried investigating conformity. Conformity is basically following, okay, um, the willingness to follow. So an example of conformity is as simple as following traffic rules, okay, or following fashion trends, or following or being pressurized into following um, something that all of our friends are doing, okay? So Ash conducted research on conformity using this problem, okay? So there was a group of participants, and in that group, there was Confederate present who was basically a research assistant. So the participants were shown different 
lines with different lengths, okay, and they were asked to um, choose the line that is of the same length or similar length as the one that was presented to them. So there were multiple problems and they were given these choices. Um, so the confederate basically was told to either choose a wrong answer or the right answer and the researcher was investigating basically whether the participants would conform to what the confederate was saying. Okay, So the same procedure was used by Abraham et al except the confederates were either introduced as in-group members or out-group members. Okay, And in this case it was either the Confederate was from the psychology department or was from the history department. So from the psychology department, since all of the students participating in this experiment were psychology students, that Confederate was part of the in-group. So they followed the same procedure where different uh, length lines were shown and the Confederate and all the participants estimated or uh, chose the one that most represented the length of the main line. And what was found is that when conforming to the in-group member, the other psychology department person or confederate, um, participants were more willing to conform publicly, okay? And it was the same with not conforming to the out-group member. And this was shown more publicly than privately. In private, when they were asked to not answer out loud, they chose the answer that they thought was most correct. Okay, and did not try conforming. Okay, so the next research, Bagby and Rector's um, investigated jury sentences for in-group and out-group members. And this research is highly applicable to real-life situations in the sense that um, similar behaviors are seen towards minority groups in court proceedings and also in law enforcement. So what these researchers basically found was that when the defendant was part of the in-group um, of the jury, they tended to give shorter sentences than when the defendant was from an out-group, okay? And they also found that when the offense of the out-group member was against one of their in-group members, they were even harsher with the sentences, okay? So in a way to protect their in-group. The next research was Drury et al. and Sheriff's research. And Drury et al. investigated pro-social behavior or basically helping behavior and Sheriff et al. investigated conflict resolution, okay? And both of them had similar findings that could be applicable, which is when there is a reduced difference between us and them, basically when there's a less shorter gap between who is us and them or the in-group and out-group, people were more willing to help and also more willing to actively solve conflict. If there was a high distinction between the us and them, again, we would try engaging in in-group bias, positive distinctiveness, so be less willing to help and less willing to uh, resolve conflicts. But when that gap has been reduced, people are more willing uh, um, to help and more willing to resolve conflicts. So SIT, if we had to evaluate it, is a highly complex theory, right? And it can explain a lot of different behaviors. And we know from the previous slides that there is a lot of empirical support and that it can be testable to an extent. But most of the testing or most of the investigations on SIT happens in controlled settings uh, as opposed to in natural settings. Okay, And all of the components that is introduced by SIT, such as social comparison, social identification, uh, and social categorization, they cannot all be technically investigated at once. Okay, so that makes the testability of uh, SIT quite limited outside lab settings. Okay, there is a significant amount of evidence, and again, these are explanatory in nature, and these are conducted in lab settings. Um, so as for the application, it's highly applicable. It can explain prejudice, discrimination, brand loyalty, why we choose to remain loyal to a specific brand like Apple versus Android, mountains versus beaches, and Coke versus Pepsi, right? So social identity theory definitely explains a lot of different behaviors, and it is applicable to real-life situations. 
there are clearly defined variables, but it is challenging to operationalize them in the sense that they can be measurable. Okay, and that also adds to the testability. Um, these um, different components of SIT can be observed, right? But there isn't necessarily a way to measure it quantitatively, right? Apart from how Tajfel used the point system, okay? So that's one way that was used, but that's not necessarily um, indicative of how real life categorization happens or comparison happens, right? So in a sense, it's difficult to clearly define these variables. In terms of being unbiased, the social identity theory can be applied to different demographics around the world. It's biased in the sense that it focuses more on group identity versus individual identity, right? It emphasizes on group identity as the driving force of behavior. And a lot of the times we can make decisions, we can engage in behaviors without having to be influenced by our groups. Okay, so that's one way that the social identity theory is biased. And finally, while the social identity theory is quite complex and can explain behavior, it doesn't necessarily have a lot of predictive validity. Okay, it cannot predict how people will behave. One example is the current Black Lives Matter movement, right? Um, if you look at it on the face value, there are a lot of people who are not African American, who are um, part of this uh, movement, okay, who are allies to this movement. So if you look at it, I mean, you could categorize them in different identities, but on the surface level, they all belong to an, a different ethnic group. Can you predict that based on their social identity, they would have stood up for the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So in that case, it explains their behavior now that maybe um, they chose to engage in social change, but also it could be that their individual identity was more salient here, right? That said, okay, yes, I need to stand up for these group of people because it's the right thing to do, okay? And another way to look at it is to have a larger social identity, which is of humanity and standing for justice, okay? So that's one way to look at it as well. But either ways, you can't necessarily predict a behavior um, using the social identity theory like you would be able to do with the theory of reasoned action and planned behavior, right? So with that, we end the social identity theory video. I hope you found this helpful.